So question 21 says, the diagnostic algorithm of newborn baby with cyanosis. So this is what you need to tell your teacher. If, as you can see that, if the child has a decreased partial pressure of oxygen, but the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high, or decreased partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide, you can see that it's the same thing in both cases. It's just that here you have a decrease, sorry, here you have increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. As you can see, tachypnea, decreased partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Tachypnea, decreased partial pressure of oxygen, but increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. In both cases, we are going to give hyper oxygen tests, so 100% oxygen for 10 minutes. If there's an increase in partial pressure of oxygen, so if there's an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen, it means that the test is positive and it means that the reason why this child had cyanosis was due to a non-cardiac cause. So central nervous damage, airway obstruction, pneumonia, metabolic disorders. But if the partial pressure of oxygen is still very low after this hyperoxygen test, the next thing you need to do is hyperventilation test. The hyperventilation test, if there's an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen, yes, it means that the cause of cyanosis was due to a persistent pulmonary, there is a pulmonary hypertension. That is what is causing the cyanosis. But if after giving this hyperventilation test, it's still negative, meaning that the partial pressure of oxygen is still low, it means that this child has a cyanotic congenital heart disease. So that is the first question. And the second question is pulse oximetry screening. Now you give it to a child, this child, before you discharge this child, you need to do the pulse oximetry screening test. Before you discharge the child, you need to do the pulse oximetry screening test. So how, how is this test performed? So you need to put one of the equipment on the right arm, and this measures, this measures the oxygen saturation preductally, so before the um, doctor's arteriosus, the doctor's arteriosus. Then the remaining, the last two, on the foot. So you're going to put one on the right arm and you're going to put one on both legs. So that is three in total. And that measures the post doctor saturation. Good. Now, when you do this test and you find out that the oxygen saturation is greater than 95% in the right arm, or you find out that the difference between the oxygen saturation between the right arm and the foot is less than 3%. It means that this child doesn't have congenital heart disease. You can discharge this newborn baby to go home with the parents. If you do this test and you find out that it is less than 90% in the right arm, or it is greater than 3% difference between the right arm and the foot, greater than 3% difference, it means that this child most likely has a congenital heart disease, okay? If it is 90 to 95 in the right arm or 3% difference between the right arm and the foot, you need to repeat this test in one hour. If in one hour the test is, the oxygen saturation increases, then the child is normal. If it remains the same, you need to take this child to see a cardiologist or for an echocardiogram to check for um, congenital defects that might be mild, M-I-L-D, mild. But if it gets worse, automatically this child has congenital heart disease and you also need to take this child to a cardiologist or for echocardiogram. 
Question 22 says the classification of heart disease. So here, let's start again. Cyanotic, yes, it presents with cyanosis. Decreased pulmonary blood flow. Decreased pulmonary blood flow, example, tetralogy of fallow, as you can see. Trichospid atresia, as you can see. Then the next cyanotic can be due to mixed blood flow. As you can see, transposition of great arteries, truncus atriosus, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Then acyanotic increased blood flow, ASD, VSD, and patent ductus arteriosus. Obstruction of blood flow from the ventricles, quartation of aorta, aortic stenosis, and pulmonary stenosis. Then the next thing we need to talk about would be Essimenja syndrome, Essimenja syndrome. Now, I need to know that when we get into the um, congenital heart diseases, most of them that we discuss, I will tell you which one, causes a left to right shunt, a left to right shunt. But what happens during the explanation, which I will explain in details when we, as we are moving towards the questions, you will see. What happens is that there is a switch Okay, and this switch will change it, will change the left to right shunt to a right to left shunt. So you can see when you have a classic example would be um, patent doctor's arteriosus. I'll say explain. You can see it's a left to right shunt. But as the um, cases, as the disease, as the congenital heart disease progresses, it will change this left to right shunt to a right to left shunt, and that is Essimenja syndrome, and it is very deadly. The treatment for this child is emergent heart and lung transplant, if not 100% fatality rate. So the question 23 talks about patent doctor's arteriosus. So I'll show you a photo so that everyone is on the same page. As you can see here, you can see what it looks like. You can see the normal anatomy, yes? But you can see in the patient with patent doctor's arteriosus, as you can see that there's a connection between the aorta and, and pulmonary trunk. And normally your left ventricle is stronger than your right ventricle. So the force it will use to pump blood out into the aorta is greater than the force that the right ventricle will use to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk. Understand? So because of that, because um, the, there's greater pressure in the left ventricle and the aorta, blood will start to mix. So the blood that is being pumped into the aorta will start to enter into the pulmonary trunk and from the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. That is why if you paid attention, when I talked about increase blood flow to the lungs, what do you see here? Patent ductus arteriosus. And when there's an increased blood flow to the lungs, it will cause increased pressure in the um, pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries. This will damage the pulmonary arteries and lead to what pulmonary hypertension. And what happens when the hypertensive state in the pulmonary uh, trunk and arteries becomes greater than the aorta. It means that instead of this left to right shunt, you will have a right to left shunt, which is what Essimenja syndrome. How does the child present? What should you tell your teacher? Of course, most cases, any question you get about congenital heart diseases, depending on the severity, yes, most child will present with deep sneer, difficulty breathing. They will present with um, failure to thrive. They will present with diaphoresis, excessive sweating, doing minimal activities like eating. Okay, good. Next. Okay, the next thing you tell your teacher will be cardiac signs like continuous murmur. So this is very important. You if you get patent doctor's arteriosus, you must talk about the machine-like continuous murmur. So this murmur is continuous. You will hear this murmur during systole and diastole. So you will hear this murmur during systole and diastole, machine-like murmur. At what site will you auscultate this murmur? Second, left intercostal space. 
second left intercostal space. Good. Another important point to tell teacher will be wide pulse pressure. So because of the increased force that the um look here, because of initially the left ventricle would increase will increase the pumping force, the contraction to try to compensate for this hole, this um patent doctor at patent doctor's arteriosus, right? And when there's an increase in the force the left ventricle is using to contract, there will be an increase in systolic blood pressure. When the heart is not contracting, yes, that is diastole. That is diastole. So the heart is not contracting. So you can see that because there's an increase in the systolic pressure, and you can see that there's no increase in the diastolic pressure. So by the time you measure systolic and diastolic pressure, you're going to see a wide gap. So that is known as wide pulse pressure. So because of the increased blood flow to the pulmonary system, yes, there will be pulmonary hypertension, and this can cause increase the risk of infection in the lungs. So the child can be prone to infection in the lungs. Yes. Also, don't forget that if there's infection in the lungs, here in the lungs, yes, the um, infection can break up and come and stay here or stay here, right? And that can cause endocarditis, right? Good. Endocarditis is inflammation of your endocardium. But when they say endocarditis, they're mostly talking about like inflammation of your valves. But that does not mean your endocardium cannot be inflamed. But when they talk about endocard endocarditis, they're mostly talking about the valves. Okay. Now, so because as you can see that PDA is an acyanotic um, um, congenital heart disease, the child will most the child will not present with what cyanosis. Good. The next question talks about X-ray signs. What are the X-ray signs you see? Because of increased blood flow to the lung, we're going to see increased pulmonary vascularity, vascularity, increased pulmonary vascular vascularity. There'll be increased. There'll be on X-ray you will see hypertrophy, or will I say enlargement of your left ventricles. Echocardiogram is the gold standard. You are going to be able to assess the degree of ventricular hypertrophy, the pulmonary artery pressure, so on and so forth. How do you treat? So we need to close this patent doctor's arteriosus. So we need to give endomectasin. Yes, what is the mechanism of action in case your teacher asks, asks you, right? What is the mechanism of action? So normally, prostaglandin, prostaglandin keeps this doctor's open. So we need to inhibit this prostaglandin. So that's why we give endomectasin. It will inhibit the production of prostaglandins, and this will initiate the closure of patent doctus atriosus. And you can see the doses, right? You can also give ibuprofen, but the drug of choice is endomectasin. Okay. I don't want to waste time. VSD, ventricular septal defect. This is a hole in the ventricular septum. As you can see here, there's a hole in the ventricular septum. And because your left ventricle is stronger than your right ventricle, blood will move from your left side to the right side, right? Good. Same presentation, initially dyspnea, sweating, doing mild exertion like feeding, so on and so forth. Right. What other thing can a teacher ask you? There are four types of VSD. It could be membranous, also known as perimembranous, which is found in the upper section of the ventricular septum. Muscular VSD is found in the lower part of the ventricular septum. So this is very easy to memorize because from your histology, you know that the ventricular septum, the upper part, the interventricular septum, not your atrium right now. Just the ventricle, the upper part is membranous and the lower part is muscular. Then we have other types such as inlet VSD and outlet VSD. Yet inlet VSD is close to structures where blood is entering the heart, such as your mitra and tricorps speed valve. Now I need to know that VSD 
is mostly not seen at birth. We mostly see VSD first to three months. Why did I say this? Because initially when the child is born, initially when they give birth to a child, the left ventricle and right ventricle have the same strength. But as the child grows, the left ventricle becomes stronger and blood will start to move from the left side to the right side and the child will start to present with signs and symptoms. So we mostly start to see presentation mostly after the first three months. First to three months, not at birth. We'll get to some um, congenital heart disease that immediately after birth, you are seeing the signs. Okay, now, what other things can you see? What are the x-ray signs? Because, of course, as you can see that VSD is also from the first um, slide. Increased pulmonary blood flow will cause increased pulmonary vascularity. Of course, you'll see cardiomegaly. Yes, you're going to see cardiomegaly because blood is entering here into the right ventricle, so there will be enlargement of the right ventricle. Also, there will be enlargement of the left ventricle too, because the left ventricle will, start, will be pumping harder. Yes, good. Why is there increased blood flow to the um, pulmonary trunk? As Because instead of the blood going to the aorta, the blood is entering into the right ventricle and up into the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. Good. Echocardiogram is still the gold standard for diagnosing these patients. And as you can see too, that patients with VSD are, can develop a Semenja syndrome. ASD is the same thing as above. It's just that this septum is found where intra, atra, intra in the, um, is found here, yes? Atra septal defects, good. And it's still the same presentation. What are the um okay? What is the key thing the teacher wants you to the teacher wants to hear? Increased risk of stroke. Look here. Normally, in a healthy um heart, let's look at a healthy heart. Let's imagine that the, we didn't have this septal defect here, right? Normally, if a patient develops deep vein thrombosis, if a patient develops deep vein, deep vein thrombosis. Most of them are broken down, but if a small clot is able to make its way into this place, if it comes down into the right ventricle, if it comes down into the right ventricle, it is pumped into the pulmonary trunk, into the pulmonary arteries, and the pulmonary arteries to the pulmonary capillaries, and they are very tiny. And the patient will mostly present with uh, signs of respiratory distress, right? And respiratory um, disturbances, not stroke, do you get it? But in a case of ASD, if there's a clot, what do you think happened? This clot can just freely enter into the um, left atrium, come down to the left ventricle, and the left ventricle will pump it to the system circulation, and this can go and block the cerebral vessels and cause a stroke. Understand? Good. So what other signs can you tell your teacher? What do they want to hear? Okay, they need to also hear that this is also a left to right shunt. Yes, there will be enlargement of your right atrium and your left right ventricle because they are receiving a lot of blood, right? And you can diagnose this. You can see this on x-ray as right atrial and right, right ventricle enlargement, right? So there'll be deviation of the heart to the right side. Okay, another important sign during auscultation is a mid-systolic murmur. And I need to know that, remember from auscultation, we have the first heart sound and the second heart sound. If you don't know the first heart sound and the second heart sound, go and read on it. But you know that the second heart sound is formed due to closure of your aortic and pulmonary valve. Now, what happens when there's, a, when there's enlargement of when it's enlargement of your right atrium and your right ventricle, just think about anything in this picture that you see that is blue. Think about it if it's getting enlarged. If it's getting enlarged, it means that it will take a longer time for your pulmonary valve to close. And remember that I told you 
Remember, I told you that the second half sound is produced by the closure of your aortic valve and pulmonary valve. So what happens when the aortic valve is closing faster than the pulmonary valve? Of course, your second heart sound will be split. So instead of doing lob dub, you'll be hearing lob dub dub, lob dub dub. So it's like it splits. Good. Okay, so the same sign again, increased pulmonary vascularity, ECG, right axis deviation, echocardiogram is the gold standard. Treatment is, of course, before surgery, you need to give diuretics, ACE inhibitors to decrease the load on the heart, then surgery to, after six months to close this defect. Depending on, the, depending on the size of the defect, yes, if it's very large, you need to close immediately. Now, the next one will be coarctation of aorta. And you can see that coarctation of aorta falls under, coarctation of aorta falls under obstruction of blood flow from ventricles. So blood cannot leave the ventricles. You need to be faster. So I need you to know that there's increased risk of coarctation of aorta in males, and there's increased risk in a patient that has Turner syndrome. Now, there are types of coarctation of aorta, preductal and postductal. Preductal is also known as the infantile type, infant, infantile type between the left subclavian artery and ductus arteriosus, and postductal after the ductus arteriosus. Now, of course, coarctation of aorta. As you can see, because during coarctation of aorta, you can see this coarctation of aorta. What happens is that because of this coarctation, your heart will be pumping harder too because there's coarctation, blood and not getting to your organs. Your organs are starving and this is stimulating your heart to pump harder. Your heart will be pumping harder and then this part, remember this will be your subclavian artery, carotid artery and one other artery, yes? They will, as the um, heart is pumping harder, this, the, the head, the neck and the upper limbs will be receiving a lot of blood, yes? But the lower limbs, abdomen and the thoracic region will not be receiving a lot of blood. So let's come back to the presentation. As you can see that there will be in the area where there is in the before. So just know that the head, upper extremities and the neck will have increased pressure. So when you palpate, when you take pulse, you're going to feel a bounding pulse. The pulse is going to be very hard, right? But when you palpate the femoral artery, it's going to be very weak. As you can see, area of high pressure, there will be, they can even be aneurysm because of the increased force the heart is using to pump. In the area with low blood pressure, there will be absent pulse, low blood pressure. Yes, there's a difference in blood pressure. Now, it's very important for you to know that the child will present with cyanosis that in the lower part of the body, there's cyanosis. In the upper part of the body, which is head, neck, and upper limb, like upper limb, there would be, that part would be pink, so there is no cyanosis. But from the lower legs, the abdomen, you can find sign of cyanosis. Auscultation, of course, you also hear a systolic murmur, right? Because the heart is trying to pump blood through this narrow aorta, and this will cause the murmur, systolic murmur, yes? When is the murmur occurring? During systole, very easy. What are the x-ray signs? Please, rib notching what is rib notching because that's why i wanted to show you this picture as you can see that um look look closely as you can see that as you can see that this intercostal artery yes as the heart is pumping harder the arteries will be rubbing on the ribs they will be rubbing on the ribs and this will cause rib notching i need to know that this rib rib notching occurs on the lower part of the rib and occurs on the third to eighth rib. It doesn't occur on the first and second rib. Another x-ray sign will be the three-figure sign, number three-figure sign. Why would this happen? Because area before the coarctation is enlarged and also area after the coarctation too is also kind of enlarged. So because of this, when you look at the x-ray, you're going to see the number three figure. Then of course, 
what's the gold standard of diagnosing it? Echocardiogram. Okay, treatment. So the treatment is because of this coarctation of aorta, we need to keep the doctor's arteriosus open. Yes, so instead of giving endometacin, we are going to give prostaglandin. Yes, so that we can keep this doctor's arteriosus open. Another treatment will be balloon angioplasty. Balloon angioplasty to open up this um, narrowing. Yes. Now, as you can see, the um, dose. 0 0.05 mcg per kg per minute yes please an important question a teacher also tell you is that oxygen is contraindicated in a patient that you are trying to keep the doctor's arteriosus open so don't fall for the teacher's trick the next thing we're going to talk about will be tetralogy of fallow and tetralogy of fallow falls under decreased pulmonary blood flow so tetralogy of fallow contains four um, defects right ventricle hypertrophy aorta displacement or overriding, pulmonary stenosis and septal defect. It's important for you to know that the pulmonary stenosis determines the severity of the disorder. So first of all, there is a septal defect. As you can see that because it's a septal defect, blood will flow from the left to the right side. There's a lot of blood in the right ventricle and because of pulmonary stenosis, the blood cannot leave the left ventricle. You can see that it's a very disastrous congenital heart disease. So here, as you can see, that tetralogy of fallow falls under cyanotic, right? So there would be there will be cyanosis. Now, come back here. So you can note that VSD, ASD, PDA, we didn't talk about cyanosis, right? If a patient has cyanosis and they have VSD, ASD, PDA, it is a Semenja syndrome, right? Coarctation of aorta, um, as, you, as you can see, that it's not complete cyanosis. The cyanosis is only in the lower limb, and that depends on the severity of the um, coarctation. The, depending on, it depends on how narrow the aorta is. You get it. So it's classified under asynotic. But tetralogy of fallow is a cyanotic disorder. So the child will present with cyanosis. So let's continue. So now it's the same presentation, deep snares, sweating and exertion, so on and so forth. But what your teacher wants to hear is TET spells. TET spells or blue spells is very indicative of tetralogy of fallow. What happens? Any child, any time the child does anything, any mild exertion, there will be cyanosis. So when a mother tries to breastfeed the child, the child is sucking their stress, the child will become cyanotic. That is TED spells. If the child is playing with a friend and every time the child is squatting, it's always squatting down to rest and there's a sign of cyanosis, TED spells. Very important, you must tell your teacher that. There's also failure to thrive. And because this is mostly a chronic disorder, there's clubbing of the fingernails. But please remember that the degree of pulmonary stenosis will determine the presentation. If the pulmonary stenosis is very narrow, this child will have a very serious um, presentation. How do you treat? Very important, knee to chest. So we bring the knee to the chest area, and this prevents um, this decreases the right to left shunt. So it's very important for you that it is very important for you to know that the tragedy of fallow is right to left shunt. And I hope you can see that most disorders that have right to left shunt mostly present with cyanosis. Another trick question your teacher can ask you is, in a patient that has anemia and a patient that has polycythema vera, what is the difference? Polycythema vera is a lot of red blood cell and anemia is lack of red blood cell, right? No blood. Which of these will have cyanosis more? It will be polycythema vera. It is easier to see cyanosis when there's um, more blood, actually. When there is no blood, it's hard for you to see cyanosis because cyanosis occurs when there is greater than 5% of deoxygenated hemoglobin. So if you don't have blood because you have anemia, where will you find the deoxygenated hemoglobin? So you can see that in a patient that has polycythema vera, there's increased, there's increased um, probability of developing that 5%, greater than 5% deoxygenated hemoglobin. I hope you understand me. So let's come back to treatment. 
knee to chest. He bring the knee to the chest to decrease the right to let shunting. Yes. Also, you need to keep the um, ductus open. So if there is any opening, if there's any um, ductus arteriosus, we need to keep it open. So we're going to give prostaglandin infusion. And the drug of choice is aprostadil. Aprostadil, as you can see. Aprostadil. We can also give morphine, beta blockers, but most importantly, we need to dilate that pulmonary valve. We need to just remove that pulmonary stenosis. It is very deadly. So we give a prostadil. What do you see? X-ray signs. In pathology of follow, you are going to see what boot shape heart. Also, transposition of great vessels. Transposition of great vessels, as you can see, this is my favorite disorder. Why is this my favorite disorder? Because look here, normally, 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 you can see that the, vert, the left ventricle pumps blood to the aorta. But in transposition of great vessels, they swap. Yes, there's a switch. So you can see that the um, aorta is on the, the aorta is on the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk is on the left ventricle. So meaning that deoxygenated blood is going to the systemic circulation while oxygenated blood is going to the lung. Can you imagine that oxygenated blood is going to the lung over and over again and it's getting oxygenated? For what reason? It just gets oxygenated continuously. It's not being used. While the, um, while the right ventricle will be pumping deoxygenated blood to the body deoxygenated blood to the body. This is my favorite, yes. And how does the child present? Of course, the apnea, sweating and exertion, so on and so forth. Yes, there's also wheezing, crackles, yes. And these crackles is diffuse. Please, your teacher asks you how do you differentiate from pneumonia. Pneumonia crackles, it's low, it's low, it's localized, but in congenital heart disease, it's diffuse. Okay, let's continue. Now, it's important for you to know that in a child with transposition of great vessels, presentation will mostly start at birth. So they can tell you that a child one hour has cyanosis and in the next 30 minutes, the child is getting worse. In like minutes, the child is getting worse, worse, worse. This is indicative. This is classic presentation of, this is mostly transposition of great vessels. It can be other disorder, but I'm just saying that this will present acutely. And I need you to know that in a child that has transposition of great vessels, if there is any defect, if there's any opening, we need to keep that defect open. So what do you give? You give prostaglandin infusion immediately. Prostaglandin infusion. X-ray sign, overshaped heart or what? Egg on a string. Echocardiogram is gold standard. Treatment is surgery automatically. Of course, before surgery, you need to give prostaglandin infusion to keep those ductus arteriosus open. If there is a septal defect, much better. We need to keep it open. Then after um, that, we need to transfer the child to have a switch, switch procedure to change it back. Okay. The last question will be pulmonary stenosis. So we're in question 29. Let's be fast. Pulmonary stenosis, and I think I've explained pulmonary stenosis a lot of time. Because of this pulmonary stenosis here, as you can see, blood is unable to leave the what? right ventricle. So I'm explaining pathophysiology, the signs, the symptoms, x-ray signs, so on and so forth. Okay, presentation is the same thing with all of them. Fatigue, deep snare, and also pulmonary stenosis is cyanosis, right? They can also be hepatomegaly. Why? If the blood is not able to leave, they will pull back into the, um, they will pull back, yes, they will pull back into the inferior vena cava, they will go back to the liver, to the spleen, and cause hepatosplenomegaly, or let's say hepatomegaly, there will be ascites, edema. So what are the signs of pulmonary stenosis? What can you also see? On auscultation, we can hear ejection systolic murmur. We are at the second intercostal space on the left side, mid-clavicular line. There's also splitting of the S2 sound, important points. ECG can show you right ventricle hypertrophy, but the gold standard will be what? Echocardiogram. Okay, how do you treat balloon, um, balloon angioplasty to dilate this stenosis? The next question will be question 30. 
hypoplastic um, left heart syndrome. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome practically means that the left part of your heart is not developed. This is a very dangerous condition. In fact, this is known as critical heart defect. Okay, so hypoplastic left heart syndrome practically means that the left part of the heart is not developed well. So of course there will be cyanosis, deep snare, sweating and exertion, tachypnea. Oh my gosh, tachypnea, please make sure you mention tachypnea. Tachypnea is very important, tachypnea. Metabolic acidosis, right? Good. X-ray sign, you're going to see right heart enlargement, practically absence of the left ventricle. ECG will reveal right ventricle hypertrophy, but please, the gold standard test will be echocardiogram. Medication um, really will not fix this, will not, there's no drug that will fix the congenital defect, so we need to give surgery. I mean, maybe you can manage the symptoms, but you need to give surgery. And the surgery is known as the Norwood Glen Fontan Procedure. Norwood Glen Fontan Procedure. Norwood Glen, G-L-E-E-N, Fontan Procedure. Okay, that's all for that.